right, learners? <laughs> Today we are going to read chapters two and chapter three of How to Eat Fried Worms by Thomas Rockwell. Are you ready? Let's go. But first, <laughs> chapter two is called Digging. <clears throat> no, said Tom, that's not fair. He and Alan and Joe were wandering around behind the barns at Billy's house, arguing over where to dig the first worm. What do you mean it's not fair, said Joe. Nobody said anything about where the worms were supposed to come from. We can get them anywhere we want. Not from a manure pile, said Tom. That's not fair. Even if we didn't make a rule about something, you still have to be fair. What difference does it make where the word comes from, said Alan. Worm's a worm. There's nothing wrong with manure, said Joe. It comes from cows, just like milk. Joe was sly and devious, a schemer. The manure pile had been his idea. You and Billy have got to be fair, too, said Alan to Tom. Besides, we'll dig in the old part of the pile where it doesn't smell anymore. Come on, said Tom, starting off across the field, dragging his shovel. If it was fair, you wouldn't be so anxious about it. Would you eat a worm from a manure pile? Joe and Alan ran to catch up. I wouldn't eat a worm, period, said Joe, so you can't go by that. Yeah, but if your mother told you to go out and pick some daisies for the supper table, would you pick the daisies off of a manure pile? My mother wouldn't ask me. She'd ask my sister. <sighs> you know what I mean. Alan and Tom and Joe leaned on their shovels under a tree in the apple orchard, watching the worms they had dunked squirming on a flat rock. Not him, said Tom, pointing to a nightcrawler. Why not? Look at him, he'd choke a dog. Jeez, exploded Alan. You expect us to pick one Billy can just gulp down like an ant or a knit? Gulping's not eating, said Joe. The worm's got to be big enough so Billy has to cut it into bites and eat it with a fork. Off a plate. It's this one or nothing, said Alan, picking up the nightcrawler. Tom considered the matter. It would be more fun to watch Billy trying to eat the nightcrawler. He grinned. Boy, it was huge. A regular python. Wait until Billy saw it. We'll let you choose where to dig, said Alan. After all, thought Tom, Billy couldn't expect to win $50 by just gulping down a few measly little baby worms. All right, come on. He turned and started back towards the barns, dragging his shovel. Okay, that was chapter two. Now it's time for chapter three, which is called training camp. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> Billy was doing push-ups in the deserted horse barn. He wasn't worried about eating the first worm. But people were always daring him to do things, and he found it was better to look ahead, to try to figure things out and get himself ready. Last winter, Alan had dared him to sleep out all night in the igloo they'd built in Tom's backyard. Why not? Billy had thought to himself. What could happen? About midnight, huddled, shivering under his blankets in the darkness, he'd begun to wonder if he should give up and go home. His feet felt like aching stones in his boots. Even his tongue inside his mouth was cold. But half an hour later, as he was stubbornly dancing about outside in the moonlight to warm himself, Tom's dog Martha had come along with six other dogs, all in a pack, and Billy had coaxed them into the igloo and blocked the door with an orange crate. And after the dogs had stopped wrestling and nipping and barking and sniffing around, they'd all gone to sleep in a heap with Billy in the middle, as warm as an onion in a stew. But he hadn't been able to think of anything special to do to prepare himself for eating a worm, so he was just limbering up in general. Push-ups, knee bends, jumping jacks. Red-faced, perspiring. Whew. Nearby, on an orange crate, he'd set out bottles of mustard and Worcestershire sauce, jars of piccalilli and mustard, a box of crackers, salt and pepper shakers, a lemon, a slice of cheese, his mom's cinnamon ten-inch sugar and cinnamon shaker, a box of Kleenex, a jar of maraschino cherries, and some horseradish, oh, and a plastic honey bear. Tom's head appeared around the door. Ready? Billy scrambled up, brushing back his hair. Yep. Ta-ra! Tom flung the door open. Alan marched in, carrying a covered silver platter in both hands. 
Joe slouched along beside him with a napkin over one arm, nodding and smiling obsequiously. Tom dragged another orange crate over beside the first, and Alan set the silver platter on it. A chair, cried Alan. A chair for the monsieur. Come on, said Billy. Cut the clowning. Buy spices, wait. Cut the clowning. Tom found an old milking stool in one of the horse stalls. Joe dusted it off with his napkin, showing his teeth, and then ushered Billy to it. Ladies and gentlemen, shouted Alan, I present my masterpiece, Verm a la Mud. He swept the cover off the platter. Ugh, cried Billy, recoiling. Okay, let's do the next chapter, too. We've got so many to do, and they're so short. Chapter 4, The First Worm. I think we need our worm back, don't you? Let's get it. The huge night crawler sprawled limply in the center of the platter, brown and steaming. Ooh, let's give it some steam. <laughs> we, need, we need a platter too, but I'm not very good at drawing platters. Okay, let's just give it some steam. Ooh, I bet it has a really gross, wormy smell. Ugh. Boiled, said Tom. We boiled it. Billy stormed about the barn, kicking barrels and posts, arguing, A nightcrawler isn't a worm. If it was a worm, it would be called a worm. A nightcrawler's a nightcrawler. Finally, Joe ran off to get his father's dictionary. <clears throat> nightcrawler. Noun. Earthworm. A large earthworm found on the soil surface at night. Hmm. Billy kicked a barrel. Still wasn't fair. He didn't care what any dictionary said. Everybody knew the difference between a nightcrawler and a worm. Look at the thing. Ugh, it was as big as a souvenir pencil from the Empire State Building. Yuck. He poked it with his finger. Alan said they'd agreed right at the start that he and Joe could choose the worms. If Billy was going to cheat, the bet was off. He got up and started for the door. He guessed he had other things to do besides argue all day with a fink. So Tom took Billy aside into a horse stall and put his arm around Billy's shoulders and talked to him about George Cunningham's brother's mini bike and how they could ride it on the trail under the power lines behind Odell's farm, up and down the hills, bounding over rocks. Rum, rum. Sure, it was a big worm, but it'd only be a couple more bites. Did he want to lose a mini bike over two bites? Slop enough mustard and ketchup and horseradish on it and he wouldn't even taste it. <sighs> yeah, said Billy. I could probably eat this one, but I've got to eat 15. You can't quit now, said Tom. Look at them. He nodded at Alan and Joe waiting beside the orange crates. They'll tell everybody you were chicken. It'll be all over school. Come on. He led Billy back to the orange crates, sat him down and tied the napkin around his neck. Alan flourished the knife and fork. Would Monsieur like it carved lengthwise or crosswise? Ketchup? asked Joe, showing his teeth. Cut it out, said Tom. Here. He glopped ketchup and mustard and horseradish on the nightcrawler. Let's do it. Ketchup. Red. Ooh. Needs a lot of ketchup. Probably needs to be thicker. Mustard. Horseradish. He squeezed a few drops of lemon juice and salted and peppered it. Billy closed his eyes and opened his mouth. Ooh, what in? Tom sliced off the end of the nightcrawler and forked it up. But just as he was about to poke it into Billy's open mouth, Billy closed his mouth and opened his eyes. No, nope, let me do it. Tom handed in the fork. Billy gazed at the dripping ketchup and mustard, thinking, Ugh, oh, it's all right talking about eating worms. But doing it, Tom whispered in his ear, mini bike. Glug. Billy poked the fork into his mouth, chewed furiously, mm, gulped, and gulped. His eyes crossed, swam, squinched shut. He flapped his arms wildly, and then opening his eyes, he grinned beatifically up at Tom. Superb, Gaston. Tom cut another piece, 
ketchuped, mustard it, salted it, peppered it, horseradished it, and lemoned it up, and handed the fork to Billy. Billy slugged it down, smacking his lips. And so they proceeded, now sprinkling on cinnamon and sugar, or a little bit of cheese, some cracker crumbs or Worcestershire sauce, until there was nothing on the plate but a few stray dabs of ketchup and mustard. Well, said Billy, wiping up and wiping his mouth with his napkin. So we are done with the first course. No seconds. Let me look in your mouth, said Alan. Yeah, said Joe. See if he swallowed it all. Sweetney, sweetney, said Billy. Look as long as you want. Where's my mouth? Hmm. Alan and Joe scrutinized the inside of his mouth. Okay, okay, said Tom. Leave him alone now. Come on, one down, 14 to go. Hmm. Better get rid of our worm, too. Since now it's in Billy's stomach. <sighs> How'd it taste? asked Alan. Good, good, said Ver Billy. Very fine, very fine. Hoo -hoo. He flapped his arms like a big bird and began to hop around the barn crying, Good, good, very fine, very fine, good, good. Alan and Joe and Tom looked worried. Uh, yeah, good, good. How are you feeling, Billy? Tom asked. Yeah, stop flapping around and come tell us how you're feeling, said Joe. They huddled together by the orange crates as Billy hopped around and round them, flapping his arms. Good, good, very fine, very fine. Woo -hoo. Alan whispered, he's crackers. Joe edged towards the door. Don't let him see we're afraid. Crazy people are like dogs. If they see you're afraid, they'll attack. It couldn't be, whispered Tom, standing his ground. One worm. Good. Goot, screeched Billy, hopping higher and higher and drooling from the mouth. Come on, whispered Tom, Joe to Tom. Hey, Billy, burst out Tom suddenly in a hearty, quavering voice. Cut it out, will you? I want to ask you something. Billy's arms flapped slower. He tiptoed menacingly around Tom, his head cocked on one side, his cheeks puffed out. Tom hugged himself, chuckling nervously. <laughs> Uh, cut it out, will you, Billy? <laughs> Billy pounced. Joe and Alan fled. The barn doors banged behind them. Billy rolled on the floor, helpless with laughter. Tom clambered up, brushing himself off. Whew. Did you see their faces? Billy said, laughing, climbing over each other out the door. Oh, jeez. Joe was pale as an onion. Yeah, said Tom. <laughs> you fooled them. Oh, jeez. Billy sat up. Then he crawled over to the door and peered out through a knot hole. Look at them peeking up over the stone wall. Watch this. The door sl swung slowly open. Screeching, Billy hopped out into the door sill, into the yard, up onto a stump, splash into a puddle, flapping his arms, rolling his head, yelling. Alan and Joe galloped up the hill through the high grass, yelling, Here he comes! Get out of the way! And then Billy stopped hopping and climbed up on the stump, calling in a shrill, girlish voice, Ooh, boys, where are you going? I'd something tell you, little boys. Alan and Joe stopped and looked back. I do. Is you going home, little boys? cried Billy. Is you tired? Who scared you, lunk? called Alan. Yeah, yelled Joe. I guess I can go home without being called scared if I want to. But ain't you in a dreadful hurry? shouted Billy. I just remembered I was supposed to help my mother wash windows this afternoon, said Alan. That's all. He turned and started up through the meadow, his hands in his pockets. Yeah, said Joe. Me too. He trudged after Alan. All right, next time's chapters five, six, and seven. Bye, bright learners. See you soon.